Murphy and Mark Bailey from Fig Securities. So, Mark, I mean, even if Janet Yellen wanted to pull the trigger, could she, given the data dependency of the Fed? Yes, we saw that read on inflation looking pretty good on Friday, but uh, consumers not appearing to be very confident at all. Yeah, good morning, Dean. I think it's important to point out in terms of the CPI print on Friday that that figure of 0.3% uh, only was just slightly higher than the 0.2%. And if you kind of delve into the details, that was only kind of rounded up from 0.255%. So it's only just above uh, expectations there. So I don't think that gives... Um, the, the Fed, the smoking gun, to, to hike uh, this week. And if, and if you want to go back even to Thursday, as you rightly point out, the consumer, the retail sales figures were, were weaker than expected, along with capacity utilization, industrial and manufacturing production figures, all below uh, what was expected. So I just don't think that the Fed has the, uh, the data there, as you point out, in terms of the data dependency to, to hike. And that's certainly what the market is pricing in, you know, kind of one in five chance of a, of a hike later this week. Not only that, but we have considerable uncertainty still looming with the U.S. election cycle and those presidential debates will get going the week after this one. And I was listening to some commentary this morning saying that the U.S. Fed does not want to be a topic of conversation at those debates that are coming up at all. One thing we haven't sort of talked about a lot on the channel this morning are some of the... You know, the unfortunate, uh, I guess, terror-related incidents in the States, uh, not only that bomb blast in New York where we still don't know the cause, but also in Minnesota there's been some sort of an attack uh, in a shopping mall. Uh, you know, how, how is this likely to impact sentiment as we head toward some of these central bank meetings? Yeah, I think it just adds to that, you know, the geopolitical risk, whether it is the elections or those, as you rightly point out, those unfortunate events, uh, the bomb blasts in, in the States as well, it just adds to, you know, the feeling of uncertainty uh, amongst consumers and also to, uh, businesses as well, maybe in terms of the election and if, depending on how those debates go and if, uh, you know, Donald Trump does perform well in those and that uh, uh, kind of predictions of a, a tight election uh, kind of uh, do go through, then obviously that uncertainty continues to build and, Again, it just holds back businesses and consumers from spending uh, big capital outlays, and that will you know, eventually lead to a slowdown in the uh, U.S. economy, which we are seeing, especially on the business side, in terms of business investment, which has been incredibly slow because of that uncertainty. And at the moment, although consumers are... Um, still spending. It is slowing down a bit, but uh, again, you know, the consumers are the driving force of, uh, of the U.S. economy, as we always talk about. Yeah, and it seems as if consumers are a little bit uh, confused as to whether good times are coming or bad times. We have a chart from Bloomberg really showing, I guess, the conundrum in consumer confidence. Uh, the number of U.S. consumers, the percentage of U.S. consumers saying it depends which is a quote, rose to the highest on record in September, according to that University of Michigan monthly survey. So again, they're pointing to the upcoming presidential election, really perhaps leading to increased uncertainty about the outlook in the United States. Let's turn away, though, can we, Mark, from the U.S., talk about the ECB. Over the weekend, we had ECB policymaker Jens Wiedemann saying that the ECB cannot solve all problems, adding that interest rates should absolutely not stay so low for longer than is needed to deliver price stability. So this seems to be adding to some of the rhetoric that was coming from the ECB at its previous meeting the week before last. What is your sort of take on what's happening in Europe right now, keeping Brexit, of course, in mind as well? That's right. And I think it does just continue that rhetoric that we have seen more globally in terms of central banks since their uh, meeting in Jackson Hole, you know, where they're trying to put the onus back on uh, governments in terms of their fiscal spending to try and uh, drive the uh, economy forward in terms of GDP and jobs growth and taking it off the, the central bank's uh, uh, st uh, monetary stimulus. Uh, and again, this rhetoric, you know, as you would probably expect from, um, from the, the German member, is, is again saying, look, we don't want to have rates so low and in terms of his economy and the German economy which is probably providing, uh, uh, performing one of the best in Europe that's the right uh, position to take but again you know the ECB does have to set rates for that broader uh, economic region and it's you know and you know the, certainly in the periphery it's still uh, very difficult high unemployment low growth so again you know I think the ECB will have to hold rates low but again you know this, that's the continuing rhetoric that they're trying to pub, uh, push the the stimulus idea 
back onto governments. You know, whether the governments will respond is, an, is another question because, you know, their backs are against the wall in terms of the amount that they can spend in terms of debt to GDP, especially in, room, uh, in, in Europe. They've got those additional constraints in terms of the fiscal spend can only be, the deficit can only be 3% uh, of, of their GDP before they do break the, uh, the Maastricht Treaty. So, you know, it's a very difficult situation, but, but certainly since Jackson Hole, uh, you know, you've seen the Bank of England, uh, the ECB come out and say, look, it's time for the governments to step up and, uh, and, and help uh, drive growth. Broader view on what's happening in Europe. Do you think, Mark, that we're, once we get past the central bank meetings, that we could be sort of heading toward a more volatile year end in Europe? We do have Italian elections looming. Um, we have obviously the conversation continuing around Brexit. I know that we've been talking for years about the problems with Europe being uh, kicked uh, down the road. You know, do we see any waning of some of the uncertainties in Europe at all? No, absolutely not. And that uh, the European situation continues to be one of my key risks going into 2017 as well. You know, everybody thinks that the Greek situation is resolved. You know, you look at the European banks. You know, whether it's the ECB's plan to address some of the 1.1 trillion euros of bad non-performing uh, debt on banks' balance sheets. You know, on Friday as well, you had the uh, the Deutsche Bank uh, announcement that it had been fined uh, uh, 14 billion. Uh, uh, um, U.S. dollars in terms of its uh, uh, trading in RMBS-related products. I mean, obviously, that will uh, Deutsche Bank will fight that uh, amount and probably settle somewhere close to four or five billion uh, U.S. dollars. But you know, you saw their shares fall eight nine percent, uh, along with their bank hybrids again, which were down uh, seven eight percent to the high seventies. Um, so again, you just you know, highlight some of the concerns that are still bubbling away below the surface in Europe and you know, I think it's going to be one of the key drivers of that volatility going into year end and into 2017. And speaking of, I mean, the, the data coming from China has been quite positive as of late, but we did have that Bank of International Settlements warning about banking stress in China. I was speaking with John Noonan from Thomson Reuters earlier this morning. He said, look, that's not a big issue now, but that could be a very big issue when we come to, again, looking out through 2017, 2018 even. What do you make of that red flag warning coming from the um, Bank of International Settlements in relation to China. Yeah, I think the BIS is kind of highlighting that and has been highlighting that metric for, for a while in terms of the amount of leverage that is in the in the banking system. It's certainly one to keep an eye on. And again, China is a, another key risk going forward as well for investors to keep a, keep a handle on in terms of whether they can manage that um, in terms of a smooth transition and whether or not they can um, you know, kind of have the uh, reserves to allow a more market-based, more rational allocation of uh, economic capital within that economy. I think they can. Uh, I'm still very much in, a, in that soft landing camp. But again, there will be bumps along the road as, as corporates um, and potentially some state-owned enterprises do go into bankruptcy. But again, I think it'd be managed in such a way that the process has been so far that it's allowed some to default. So it's showing investors that you know all investments are not created equal. There's no not always a implicit government guarantee there. Um, and I think it's, it does lead to the, the more rational allocation of, of capital from investors, and that's the right way to, uh, to position the market going forward. So, Mark, last week, a real hallmark of uh, the markets that you operate in was, you know, bumper invest investment grade issuance in the U.S. in particular. Is that expected to continue this week? Are, are we going to see these corporates really trying to get ahead of these central bank meetings later in the week? Yeah, I, I think so. I think you'll see quite a bit of issuance um, at the start, start of the week, you know, ahead of the uh, any potential moves by the BOJ, lesser extent to the Fed. Um, but again, what is driving that issuance is huge invest demand. We're seeing amongst our investor base and also in the institutional investor base as well that search for yield that uh, drive for income you know it's 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 pervasive across all markets and whether you know you're seeing them extend duration or expend, extend down the credit uh, risk spectrum to try and uh, grab that additional yield uh, you're seeing that across the curve and that's why you're seeing a lot of issuance uh, stepping up because it's a very very attractive time to for corporates to issue into this market it's uh, very positive in terms of the technicals and that I think for the moment is likely to continue for the next few weeks or few months, although, as we all know, technicals can change very quickly on, on very uh, quick changes in sentiment. Yeah. Uh, but at the moment, it's, it's very positive for issuers. And just quickly, does that hold true in Australia as well? 
Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 not just um, a global phenomenon. But we're also seeing that uh, domestically as well. Okay, Mark. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Nadine. Have a good Mark one. Mark Bailey there from Fig Securities, and we'll check.